okay. It is straight up six o'clock and I actually got the feed going a couple of minutes early tonight so people could pop in. So I'm trying to get better about these sorts of things. Um, it is time to go ahead and get started. We've got a good bit of crowd. Uh, good to see you guys. Looks like Jeff, Dale, Lori, Taffany. Good to see all of you guys. Um, we will go ahead and begin. And as is become our usual thing, I am going to give a study of the upcoming lessons for this coming Sunday, which are um, you know the Old Testament and the Gospel lesson. And we kind of pick them apart, we talk about them, and we, um, we look at the theme that each of the texts are going to bring to us. And so our theme this week that hopefully I will do a good job of breaking out, bringing out in these texts is that Jesus brings peace with God but not necessarily peace Ugh. Ugh. so jesus brings peace with god but not necessarily peace with the world jesus brings peace with god but not necessarily peace with the world Okay, that's what we're going to talk about today. So the Old Testament lesson for this coming Sunday is also going to be from Jeremiah chapter 28. So again, if you have your Bible, your app handy, you can go ahead and flip over to Jeremiah 28. But if you don't, I am going to read it for us so we can follow along now. Um, Jeremiah 28, verses 5 through 9. Now, before I read it, let's talk about a little context. Yes, Sue, you need to learn to get here on time, doggone it. Um, so, my goodness, is that my good friend Eric Ellison again? Easy E is with us again, the legendary Easy E, my ex roommate from 1991 and my college fraternity brother from the late 80s. Good to see you with us, brother. Okay, so we talked last week about Jeremiah. Jeremiah was in a really difficult spot because he's sitting here trying to pour his heart out to God's people, and he's talking to a group of people that absolutely, positively don't want to hear it. And in Jeremiah's day, um, the pretty much the entirety, except for a very small percentage of the remnant, a, a, a large portion of um, a large portion of the society at the time, wanted nothing to do with God and His Word. They wanted to live life on their own terms. They wanted to, um, they didn't want to follow God's rule. They worshipped other gods. They did whatever they wanted to do. They just, like, totally didn't care. And so when Jeremiah was preaching, it was like preaching to a brick wall. But then it got worse because God was telling Jeremiah to tell them, basically, look, if you guys don't straighten up, the hammer's going to fall. You know, the Velvet covering is coming off the iron glove, and you're going to get sent off into exile, and all these bad things are going to happen, and doom, gloom, and destruction, and so nobody really liked Jeremiah. We studied Jeremiah last week. We're going to talk about Jeremiah again today. So, Jeremiah verse five, verses 5 through 9 of Jeremiah 28. Then... The prophet Jeremiah spoke to Hananiah the prophet in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord make the words that you have prophesied come true and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord and all the exiles. Yet, hear now this word that I speak in your hearing and the hearing of all people. The prophets who preceded you and me from ancient times prophesied war, famine, pestilence, 
against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, when the word of that prophet comes to pass, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent that prophet. All right, what is he talking about? Okay. Now, a little context, because this prophet Hananiah, in fact, uh, it said that uh, Jeremiah spoke to Hananiah the prophet. So Hananiah was this other prophet. All right, and Hananiah was the one who was preaching in the temple in the actual house of God. And uh, like we said, Jeremiah was not very popular because he was telling people the truth and people don't like to hear the truth. Um. Jeremiah was saying that this Babylonian exile, you remember last week we talked about Jeremiah was gotten hot water because he was telling everybody, look, if you don't repent, don't straighten up, Babylonian exile, God's going to haul all of you off, so you better get it together. And he got thrown in jail and all sorts of bad things happened for it. Well, now the Babylonian exile is actually going on, but Jeremiah had said that the Babylonian exile was going to last 70 years. That's a long time. So God's people were going to be holed up, prisoners, hostage, in exile, for 70 years. But then Hananiah, who had kind of gotten the gig of preaching in the temple, came out and said, uh, No, guys, God told me it's only going to be two years. This is going to be over before you know it. Don't worry about this. This is going to pass rather quickly. Two years, no big deal. Now, if you're sitting here being held captive in a foreign country, treated who knows how, and one guy says, you know, God's going to set everything right after two years, and another guy comes along and says, eh, it's going to be more like 70, which message is going to be more popular to you, do you think? Well, obviously, Hananiah's message is going to be popular. And like he was coming around saying, God's going to set us free, we'll be restored, two short years, no big deal. And yeah, that made everybody happy, and that made everybody feel good. The problem is it wasn't true. Jeremiah was saying, no, it's going to be 70 years. Well, Guess how long it actually, the Babylonian exile actually lasted? 70 years. So, we're, you're starting to see a theme here that sometimes the truth isn't popular. And so sometimes when you have God's message laid up against the world's message, there's going to be a very, very different reaction to it. And a lot of times it's going to be the world's message that the world wants to hear because the world's good at telling you what you want to hear. But God's word is truth and sometimes it's unpleasant to hear. But it's true. So you start to see that there's an issue here. There's a disconnect between the message of God and the message of the world. So there's this big to-do. So Jeremiah said, 70 years, it's going to get nasty. Hananiah said, nah, two years, it's going to be all good. Well, then Jeremiah started to speak. And you heard in the text, first he said, Amen, may the Lord make it so. In other words, what he's saying is, I really hope that's the way it is. It would make me very, very happy if that's how it turns out to be. That would be awesome. But at, as much as Jeremiah wants this to be true, he's got to stand up for God's truth and speak what God told him to say. So Jeremiah makes the point. He says that the prophets who preceded you and I always talked about war and famine and pestilence.
All of the prophets of God, all of the biblical prophets, were not in the business of talking about how everything's going to be great and happy and we're all going to be sitting around the campfire holding hands and singing Kumbaya because there aren't going to be any problems. All of them talked about the fact that there's going to be war and there's going to be famine and there's going to be pestilence. Even Jesus preached about war and famine and pestilence. And, well, you look at Old Testament history, and you look at life ever since, life right now, and life in the future until Jesus comes back, there's always been war. There's always been famine and hungry people. We right now in a COVID-19 world know about pestilence. God has never promised to shelter us from these things. In fact, him, his prophets, and his word has always said, this is how it's going to be. Yeah, it's not going to be all bad. I mean, you're going to have God's blessings side by side with uh, war, famine, pestilence, and trials and problems. But the popular preachers who want to remove the unpleasant stuff from their preaching is simply not telling the entirety of the truth. And so Jeremiah is saying... Hey, the message I'm telling you, the ugly, nasty message, this is how they've always done it. And so, of course, that would make Jeremiah's message unpopular, but it's going to give it credibility. Because all of God's prophets always prophesied that stuff, and it always came to pass. So, the other thing, the other thing, uh, this is a world of sin. And see, Jeff, you know, yes. Because where does all of this junk come from? Well, Jeff, Jeff gets a bell. All of this stuff comes from, it's rooted in sin. We talked, was it last week or the week before, how when God makes something, the devil is not going to just kick back and let it be, the devil's sole purpose is to literally destroy everything that God has made. Well, his main weapon is sin, and it manifests itself in a variety of ways. So, um, the devil is trying to destroy peace, he's trying to destroy harmony, he's trying to cultivate division, he's trying to inflict pain, he's trying to inflict fear. And he does that through sin. All of these things are rooted in sin. But the point is that this is how it's always been. And the other thing, this, this is something that we should do well to hear today because you should beware of any teaching of God, supposedly of God, that promises no problems or no trouble this side of heaven. And there are preachers out there that preach that. Um, there are plenty of faithful preachers who preach God's truth. There are also plenty who, have, who are trying to give a happy, clappy message. And that's simply not reality. Our reality in this sinful world is going to be marked by trials to go along with the blessings. And so Jeremiah wraps up his speech by saying, Well... When a prophet talks about peace and all of this stuff, when the word of that prophet comes to pass, then we'll see that he's true. So in other words, Jeremiah is saying, look, you're saying two years, I'm saying 70. You're saying no problem, I'm saying there's going to be war and pestilence and famine and, tri famine and trials. Let's see who's right. The one who is right is truly a prophet of God. The one who is wrong will be shown to be a false prophet. And you shouldn't listen to that guy. Now, again, like we said, history has shown that it's Jeremiah's prophecy of trouble as opposed to an easy life is going to be more in line with reality and with God's truth. Now, here is the big point to take away from this text of Jeremiah. Okay? And that is this. God has promised us deliverance from sin.
God has promised deliverance from sin. He has not promised us an easy life. An easy life has never been promised to us by God. He's promised us deliverance from sin. He's promised us heaven. He's promised us his guidance and his strength in times of endurance in trials. But never anywhere in Scripture is it taught that God's children will experience an easy life. In fact, the whole Bible is filled with teachings exactly to the contrary. Like the old country song from the 70s, Lynn Anderson, I beg your pardon, I never promised you a rose garden. It's true. I don't think she was talking about the Bible when she sung it, but theologically that is accurate. Okay, so now you can see our theme. Okay, God has a message. The world has a different message. Those messages are very different. The world's message is going to be popular. But God is not in the business of being popular. God is in the business of truth. God is not in the business of being popular. God is in the business of truth, as testified to by Jeremiah versus Hananiah, and as testified to looking what God has actually promised us, deliverance from sin, not a lack of problems. Okay, so that is Jeremiah. Now, the gospel lesson today is from Matthew chapter 10. So if you have access to God's Word, you can flip over to that. You know what? I don't... Uh, ch -ch 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 -ch. Yes, ding, 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 Jeff. Okay. All right, so... Remember our theme. Jesus came to bring peace with God, but not necessarily peace with the world. Jesus came to bring you deliverance from sin, not necessarily popularity. Jesus came to give you deliverance from sin, not necessarily an easy life that's going to be free of pain and suffering. Isn't it the normal, natural, worldly way to think of, okay... God's going to bless all of his children, so being a child of God means God's going to take away and fix all your problems, but yet that is the opposite of what Scripture teaches. And you're going to see that right now in Matthew 10. So like we said, as we crack open Matthew 10, look at how it fits into our theme. So Matthew 10, 34, verse 42. If you don't have it, I'm going to read it right now. Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person, because he is a righteous person, will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water, because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Alright, let's tear open into this and see what God's trying to say to us. Now, those are kind of shocking words. Look at what Jesus said to start it off. Don't think I came to bring peace to the earth. Don't think I came to bring peace, because that's not what's happening. On the surface, that's kind of a contradictory statement from Jesus, because Jesus is supposed to be the Prince of Peace. 
So in a way that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Well, how do we make sense of this? In what context is Jesus talking about when he says this? Well, Jesus came to bring peace between God and man, but not necessarily between man and man. Again, we notice the differences in the Jeremiah text. Here you see in the, the, the difference is spelled out right here. How, how do you understand when Jesus says, I didn't come to bring peace? Well, he, bring, he came to bring peace between you and God. But he didn't necessarily come to bring peace between man and man. So here we go. Jesus gives us peace with God, but not necessarily peace with the world. Now, why is this? How come there's not going to be peace when we're talking about Jesus? And that is very simply because the message of the gospel will be divisive. The message of the gospel will be divisive because some are going to believe the message, others are going to reject the message. So, there's always going to be this tension here. Jesus makes promises. He preaches. He teaches. He has a message. He's got a message of the way to heaven. Some people are going to accept it by the power of the Holy Spirit. Some aren't. Now, this is important. It's really, really important because for you today out there, as you hear, the world throws all sorts of of things at you and you know to be totally honest with you one of the reasons that I have become that I became a Lutheran a little bit later in life is the Lutheran idea uh, addressing the question of well how do I know what truth is how do I know what's true and what's not true because this church says that and this church says the other and this preacher says this and this guy on TV says that and the guy on the radio says something different altogether you know, you hear all of these different messages that are allegedly tied to Jesus. How do I know which one is true? It's confusing. Well, the reason why I, uh, I gravitated to Lutheran theology is Lutheran theology says, if you want to know truth, what does the Bible say? Okay, the Bible is God's word. The Bible is the source of truth. There are no errors in the Bible. So if you want to know what truth is, that's where you go. So we're seeing what the Bible says here about worldly peace and lack of problems, right? For you, when you listen to all of the many messages that the world may throw at you, you should understand and know that any version of Christianity that you may come across that emphasizes stress-free living absolutely contradicts what Jesus is teaching here and specifically in this verse. He said, don't think I came to bring peace to the earth. There's no need to throw stones and, you know, name names at specific uh, preachers or what have you, but um, you ought to be able to identify it when you hear it. When you start hearing things about Christianity being a focus on a lack of problems, beware, red flag, Jesus says otherwise. Okay, and then Jesus sort of doubles down on all of this because he came here to set a man against his father. Where, where's the exact? Uh, where's the exact message? Let's see here. I've come to set man against father, daughter against mother, daughter-in-law, mother-in-law. Persons, enemies will be in his own household. So, enemies within the household. So, is Jesus some kind of deranged anarchist who wants us to, um, who wants us to hate our families and turn against the people we love? Well, clearly not. Well, then, what is he saying here? What does this What does this stuff mean? Well, it means this. 
acceptance or rejection of the gospel, we said it's going to be divisive, right? The gospel is going to be divisive because some people will accept and some will reject. Acceptance or rejection of the gospel is going to cause that division, and it could even cause division within units as tight as a family household. He's not telling us that uh, we should turn against our loved ones, but if you, it is possible that you and someone whom you love and are very close to may have a different confession of Christ entirely, and that's going to create division. And he's telling his apostles to be aware of that. Now remember, this is uh, Matthew 10. We talked about Matthew 10 last week. This is right before he's sending the 10 out um, to preach and teach and to do his ministry and so forth. So he's giving them a warning, but again, the, the message, notice there's a difference. Worldly thinking and godly thinking, completely different. Jesus came to reconcile us to God, not necessarily the world. So you can see our theme taking shape over and over and over again. All right, now he starts to explain a little bit because he says in the text, whoever loves father and mother, etc., more than me cannot be my disciple. All right, so now you start to get it, okay? Because the issue really is the issue of priorities in life. What we're talking about here is priorities. Now, if you've been to one of my Bible studies here in uh, Trinity Lombard, Illinois, you know I've told you over and over, when the list of priorities are made in your mind and heart, numbers 1, 2, and 3 are set in stone by God's Word, Number four and beyond, you have free reign to make those uh, according to your heart's desire as long as none of them are sinful. But there are three priorities in life in order. And they are, one, God. Two, family. And this is uh, family and extended family. So this will be father, mother, brother, sister, grandparent, the family unit. And number three is your vocation. Now your vocation is your calling in life because everybody has callings in life. Everybody has multiple callings in life, truth be told, because your vocation is not just what you do for a living uh, to earn a paycheck if you work outside of the home. A vocation is not only a doctor or a lawyer or a chef or an accountant, but a vocation in God's eyes is also being a mother, being a father, being a grandparent, being a godly son or daughter, being a godly brother or sister, etc., being a godly husband, being a godly wife. All of these things are vocations. And so... These are the priorities set forth in our hearts when the Holy Spirit is driving the car and things are right within us. Jesus is number one. Because only Jesus can save you from your sins. Only Jesus can get you into heaven. Only Jesus has the power to actually change your circumstances in life. Only Jesus has the power to comfort you against all of the uh, problems that sin is going to cause you in this life and then take you to heaven when your time is done. So if he's not number one, you've got issues. Number one is Jesus, and this is what he's saying here. Anyone who loves other people more than me, that's, that's, you can't be my disciple. Of course, your family's number two, and then your vocation's number three. Now the problem is when you start inverting the order, and this is, what the de this is exactly what the devil tries to do. Like we said, the devil is not going to stand by and uh, let you waltz off into heaven without a fight. The devil wants to try to screw up everything that God has made and ruin God's design. So, 
there's nothing wrong with having a lot of love for your family. There's nothing wrong with loving your children to death in the moon and back. As long as you don't love them more than God and his word. If your children become more of a priority to you than God is, you're going to have problems. It's okay to love your vocation. It's okay to sink yourself into your vocation and try to do the best you can. But if you start to love your vocation more than you love your family, problems are going to set in. And obviously, if your trust is in your vocation more than your trust is in Jesus, you're really in deep trouble. So these are the priorities in order. God, family, vocation. And that's what Jesus is saying. Anyone who loves um, their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And, you know, a priority can also be understood as not, not only what is more important, not only what do you give your time to, but what do you put your trust in? Do you put your trust in Jesus for your salvation and your problems in life? Or do you put your trust in your job? See, the, these, the devil is constantly trying to shuffle the dominoes up. But this is the order that God has designed it. And Jesus reinforces that right here. And I saw Sue pop up and say... So eerily familiar, well, you know, it ought to be because every single one of us have been assaulted by the devil to try to invert this on some level. Everybody, the devil always tries to invert this. This is what he does. Okay, so then Jesus says, Aha, whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Now this says a mouthful here. Whoever does not take up your cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Is not worthy of me. Now understand, a cross is a means of suffering, pain, and death. So he literally just said, Jesus literally just said, if you're not... If you want a life free of suffering, this ain't what following me is all about. Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me if you want to be my disciple. If you're not willing to suffer, if you don't want suffer to be part of the equation, then um, you're not going to be able to be my disciple. Now, again, this is important because, one, that's exactly the opposite of what the world wants. The world wants a stress-free life. Number two, um, there are teachings out there today that are just flat-out dangerous that, that, that contradict this. Have you ever heard of the so-called prosperity gospel? The prosperity gospel is that idea that well, God loves you so much that he wants you to be happy so much that God blesses you materially in accordance with how good of a Christian you are. You know, you do a bunch of good stuff. God's going to give you a little more money. And if you're really, really good at Christian, may, being a Christian, maybe you get the lake house in Wisconsin on the, on the lake with, with, you know, the three stories and the indoor bowling alley and movie theater. But that's not how it works. The, and the prosperity gospel is all over the place in this day and age. If you hear it, again, it ought to raise a red flag to you because Jesus does not say the Christian life is about a lack of suffering. Jesus, Sue, I wasn't going to mention my dear fellow Houstonian, Pastor Olstein, but yes, okay, this is what he teaches. This is exactly what he teaches. Uh, you read uh, Joel Osteen's books, uh, well, what's one of them? Uh, Your Best Life Now. Look, there's nothing wrong with um, self-motivation, and there's nothing wrong with trying to work on being a better you and all of those things. There's nothing wrong with that at all. 
But that is not the basis of Christianity. The basis of Christianity is deliverance from sin through suffering, the suffering of Jesus. And so the suffering that you and I endure in our life mimics Jesus. If Jesus had to suffer, why wouldn't we think we would ought to? Okay, so, um, yeah, the idea of the prosperity gospel and the idea that Jesus is here to take away your problems go, ex go against what Jesus is teaching. Okay. Now, there's a little bit more. Mm, let's see. There is a little bit more here. Bear with me, por favor. Got to make some room. If you haven't uh, seen the Jeremiah stuff, it's got to come down. We need more room for Matthew. Because there's more to glean out of this. Okay, Jesus says something weird. Well, he says a lot of things that are weird to our sinful human ears. But what he says next is, whoever finds his life is going to lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Loses life for me will find it. What does he mean? Jesus is saying that when earthly things are prioritized over him, remember he's in the number one slot, when earthly things are prioritized over him, that that person is going to lose his eternal life because Jesus is the only one who can give eternal life. That's why he came. If you're not uh, following Jesus, if your trust is not in Jesus, there's no other place for eternal life. So if you try to chase something else for it, you're going to lose it. But, well, actually, it also tells us that there is a big difference between worldly life, worldly life, and eternal life from God. That is a gift from God. There is a difference, and this difference, if you've noticed, has been highlighted over and over and over through these passages. There is a difference between the world, the world's view of things, and God's views of view of things. Big difference. But then he says, whoever, um, well, whoever. Uh, whoever, where is the exact verbiage? One moment. Whoever, uh, de 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 de. whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Okay, so in other words, if you're willing to shove the worldly perspective things down below and keep him number one, by the way, that's what the Holy Spirit does. That's not something you're capable of doing because we're sinners. But when that happens, when Jesus is kept as number one, you find your eternal life. Because that's what he brings. So, the idea of pulling God out of number one and putting literally anything else, that's what sin does. And the process of putting whatever sin had put number one, pulling it out and putting God back, that is known as repentance and repentance is a good thing but repentance can be a painful thing but this is how it works whenever we repent we realize we were wrong and by the way we do this all the time stuff gets more important than jesus on a daily basis for all of us because the devil's really good at distracting us but god and his holy spirit calls this to our attention oh yes lord i'm sorry Back to number one, please forgive me, God, and he always does. And then when that happens, we uh, find our eternal life because that's what Jesus gives. Okay, then the last section, again, he's sending the 12 apostles out to do ministry. Okay, let's see. Ooh. All right, Lori. We are such self-centered people that we always want to think it's about us. When it's really about God, He is personal, but He is sovereign. We are very 
self-centered people. Um, I think you'll find that it's true that the, you know, that, that's, that's the game the devil plays. The more materially blessed a society is, the more self-centered it becomes. Because the more someone or a group of people has, the less they actually realize their need of God. We don't need God because we've got a lot of food and a lot of money. The people in Africa who are starving, who don't have a lot of food and don't have a lot of money, well, they're more inclined to cling to this message of God than, uh, than someone who has it made in the shade in the nice uh, lake house in Wisconsin with the bowling alley and the swimming pool. Okay. So Jesus then says, whoever receives you, receives me. <clears throat> now that's quite a message because since the apostles are Jesus' chosen authorized representatives and mouthpieces. What Jesus is saying is that if anybody who rejects the apostles, that's the same thing as rejecting him. Now, it's not that the apostles are as good as Jesus, but the apostles' message, the gospel, is the same message Jesus preached. So, that's the connection. And so to reject the message of Jesus as Lord for the forgiveness of sins, to reject that from the apostles, would be the same thing as rejecting Jesus himself. Okay, now take this a little bit further and look at today. Okay, ordained pastors, we uh, as Lutherans, we say they are part of the apostolic succession. Jesus called the apostles, and he continues to call further apostles. We call them pastors, we call them priests, we call them whatever, but in the church, someone who is ordained, ordination means that the authority to speak on God's behalf is being bestowed upon this person, insofar as what they say lines up with what the Bible says. And that's a really big insofar as. But... My, me as an ordained person, um, when I speak biblical truth, I am authorized by God to speak for him. And when I say what the Bible says, I'm doing precisely that. Now, if I get off topic and I start spouting off my own personal views that can't be supported with Scripture, or I say something that directly contradicts Scripture, well, now that authority no longer applies. You shouldn't listen to me when I go off on these wild tangents. But when I s preach what the Bible says, I am authorized by God to speak for him. Therefore, if you reject what I say when I'm preaching scripture, then you're rejecting Jesus. But it goes a step further even yet because you out there are members of the priesthood of all believers. And that means you have a calling too. I'm not the only person that is called vocationally to be a representative of Christ. I do so in the context of the church. But as you live your daily life, you are Jesus' representatives and ministers. So that is to say that if you proclaim Christ, be it witness for Christ in a Bible-pleasing way, be it show an act of kindness in the name of Christ, be it live out your life following the Ten Commandments, all of these are a testimony of Jesus. And so that means that when you are living the Christian life as a testimony to Jesus, if someone receives you and your testimony, they are receiving Jesus. But if someone rejects you, condemns you, because of your faith in Jesus and your life 
of faith in Jesus. That is the same thing as rejecting Jesus itself. And Jesus has told us with his own words, you should expect it. Don't think I came to bring peace. Because the world at its core, the, the sinful nature in the world, hates the message of the gospel. Yet that's what embodies you as God's child. So because you are embodied by the gospel, you're going to have problems. This is why you're not going to have peace with the world like our theme says. Jesus came to bring peace with God, not necessarily peace with the world. Because when you stand up for Jesus, preach the gospel in your way as a member of the priesthood of all believers, you just might find some resistance because Jesus came to bring peace between God and man, not necessarily between man and man. Taffany. I also think some of those privileged people believe those riches and privilege are blessings from God, and therefore they feel they are serving God the way they're supposed to, even though they're not. See, this is what we were talking about before. Now, it gets a little muddy, okay, because the fact is that all of these blessings we're talking about are, in fact, from God. The issue, though, is that God doesn't bless you in accordance with the level of your Christianity. You know, in other words, the better Christian you supposedly are, then God's going to bless you materially. That is exactly this prosperity gospel stuff that we talked about earlier. Um. And you are right, Taffany, when you start believing that, okay, I'm serving God the way that I ought to be serving God because I have peace with the world, you're kind of getting off in the weeds. You know that you are serving God when you are following his word. When Jesus is number one, we have our priorities. God first, family second, vocation third. When Jesus is number one, that's when you're going the right way. Sue, how do you deal with the riches is another story, using it for God. Well, see, every good thing can be used for good or evil. And the Holy Spirit's going to lead you to use it for good. The devil is going to try to entice you to use it for evil. So if you win lotto next week... That's not necessarily a bad thing. The potential problem, well, the Holy Spirit's going to want you, is going to lead you to want to use that for the betterment of society, to help the poor, to further the message of the gospel, support the church, and so forth and so on. But when you're only focused on how to use the riches for me, in other words, Jesus isn't number one in your thinking. That's when you start to get into trouble. Very good stuff, guys. Okay, what else do we have? He who receives me receives him who sent me. The one who, okay, the one who receives a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. So we said, the, Jesus says, if they receive you, they're receiving me. And if they receive you and me by default, they're going to get the proper reward. Now, what is this reward that we're talking about? Well, the reward that we're talking about is eternal life. Forgiveness. And again, this only comes through Jesus because that's why he came. The one who receives the prophet will receive the prophet reward. This prophet's reward, because now, now again, when you receive, you're doing it through Holy Spirit given faith. And so the result, the reward of that is forgiveness of sins, eternal life. Whoever gives one of these little ones even a cold cup of water, what does Jesus mean by little ones? Well, he could be talking little in terms of physicality. He could be literally talking about actual little children and taking care of those who are unable to take care of themselves. When you do that in the name of Jesus, um, you're doing the work of the Lord. 
but he could also be talking about not just little ones physically, but what about little ones spiritually? Okay, you hear Jesus talk about the faith of a child. Childlike faith, Jesus says often, is what gets you to heaven. Well, what do you know about childlike faith? Okay, a child, if you tell a child, if you tell a four-year-old child, hey, when I get home from work this evening, we're going for ice cream. Four-year-olds don't question. Four-year-olds haven't been jaded. Four-year-olds aren't cynical. If you tell them this, they're going to believe it automatically. They're innocent. They haven't been kicked in the tush enough times yet by the world, hopefully. And so when you tell a small child something, they instantly believe it without any questions. Well, when the Holy Spirit is at work in your mind and your heart, that's precisely how one is going to receive the Word of God. That is precisely how one is going to see Jesus. No questions. You know, you tell the, uh, the 15-year-old kid that's been bounced from foster home to foster home, had to deal with abuse, had to deal with rejection, you tell them you're going to do something nice for them, they'll be like, yeah, right, I've been lied to so many times, I don't believe anybody anymore. And again, this is what the world, notice there's a difference, see here the difference again between the world's message and God's message. The world has a way of kicking you and kicking you and kicking you to the point that you start to doubt and question everything, which is precisely what the devil wants. But, Holy Spirit-given faith, don't ask no questions when it comes to Jesus. God says it, that settles it. And so this is what we're talking, when, when you hear this little ones, he could be talking about doing things to help the poor and to help the defenseless and to help those who can't help themselves, but he also could be talking about spiritual children, which is what you and I are by faith. So when you give one of these little ones a cold couple, he will by no means lose his reward. So in other words, acts of love and acts of kindness are reflective of our faith in Christ and therefore are reflective of our salvation. Okay, so I think as we've gone through all of this, you guys have been able to see our theme. Our theme, Jesus brings peace with God, not necessarily peace with the world. And so our summary will be this. The world has separated us from God because of sin. By, na by man's nature, God and man are enemies. But forgiveness for that sin is there in Jesus, and it is given to everyone who believes on him as Lord and Savior, and that faith comes from the Holy Spirit given in baptism. So those who have faith in Jesus now have peace with God, but have conversely made themselves an enemy to the unbeliever. So therefore, faith in Jesus, while it brings you peace with God and gives you eternal life, may not bring you peace with the world. In fact, it could cause you problems. Because the world is going to try to get you to trust in it and its material things over God. But you have the secure promise of eternal peace in heaven. Again, God's promise to you. Deliverance from sin and eternal life, not a world, not to live in a world this side of heaven free of problems. Okay. So I think you can see how Jeremiah 28 and Matthew 10 tie into our theme. Um, are there any other thoughts or questions before we shut, shut her down tonight? If none, and I know there's a 30-second delay, so we'll probably start praying right when somebody fires off a great question, but this is the chance we're going to take. So let us close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, 
forever and ever. Amen. And Barb sneaks in under the wire. So many people are understanding and participating tonight. It is fun to see. The more fun, the more questions, the more banter, the better these are. The, that is exactly, guys, why I stream this instead of pre-recording it. I could pre-record it and post it, and you'd get the same content, but I like the interaction. I love interaction. And thank you, Barb, for noticing. And yes, our intent is to keep this going on uh, long term, even after COVID. Um, once we get back to phase five, if that ever happens, I don't know if it'll stay on Thursday night, but we will have a weekly streamed Bible study of some sort most weeks. So with that, uh, Lori beat me to the punch. Um, if you're in the Lombard area, uh, we are having live worship with restrictions. Social distancing measures are in place. Uh, disinfecting pews, uh, masks are required. Uh, when we have communion, uh, things are in place to try to make communion safer and so forth. Um, but we have worship services at 9 and at 10.30 a.m. on Sundays. If you haven't done so yet, uh, we would like you to let us know which one you want to attend if you'd like to come because we're trying to manage attendance to keep them below uh, the recommended guidelines from the CDC so that uh, we can responsibly and safely gather together and worship. And so this way, if we know we're coming, uh, if we have to ask people perhaps to, to go to a different service, uh, we can manage attendance and that's just being responsible. So uh, look for us, uh, 9 and 10.30 a.m. live here at Trinity Lutheran in Lombard, Illinois. We will continue to stream our 9 a.m. service from Trinity online at the same place as our Facebook page, Trinity Lutheran Church and School, Lombard, Illinois, or our website, trinitylombard.org. And we will be back again next Thursday for another Bible study. Believe it or not, I actually got halfway through that one, if you can believe that. Uh, that's quite an accomplishment. So... I thank all of y'all for watching. If you made comments, good for that. I think I made one bad joke with the Lynn Anderson reference. I'm probably entitled to a buzz. Um, thank you for watching, and we look forward to seeing you again in worship and Bible study. May the Lord very richly bless your day.